you, Leon. Thank you, Kirsten. And thank you, Andrew. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and to be talking with people who are um, as interested in these issues as I am. Um, I'd like to particularly thank Andrew for getting up to talk. It, it occurs to me sometimes that most of us in this room are professionals and when we get up to speak in public forums, at some level there's a bit of a mask that we put on because it's my professional self that I'm showing to you. Um, and we're talking about the fact that our services refer to people's sons, people's daughters, people's mums, people's brothers, people's sisters. Um, but we're still at some level behind that professional mask. And Andrew has got up and actually showed you Andrew. And it's not an easy thing to get up in front of a group of people and say that you've been an injecting drug user. And so I would like to personally acknowledge the courage that it takes. And what I've learned is that it's that kind of courage and those kind of personal stories and connections that, um, that really make a difference. So thank you. And I didn't pay him to say that the service was good, I promise. <laughs> So I guess my job today is to talk to you about supervised injecting facilities or drug consumption rooms. Um, for the purpose of the talk today, I'm really just going to talk about safe rooms or safe spaces because in a way I think that captures really the essence of what makes them worthwhile. Supervised injecting facilities, drug consumption rooms, it focus on, focuses on the drug use, which is obviously you know, an inherent part of what we do, but actually the key reason that these services work is because it's about providing a safe space. It makes it safer for the local community. It makes it safer for the person coming in to use. So I guess my job is really to talk to you about what safe spaces are, as well as what they're not, and what safe rooms can do, as well as what they can't do. So as Kirsten said, I'm a, a doctor. I'm a public health physician by trade, and I started working in King's Cross nearly 20 years ago. And it was a fascinating place to work. I was very green when I started working there and really had no concept about drug and alcohol. I didn't have any of my friends that had ever injected a drug. Um, I was very naive and it took me you know, quite a while even to learn the lingo of, of, of what it was, um, which probably prepared me well for coming to Scotland and trying to understand your lingo even when you're just talking normal English, let alone <laughs> the drug paraphernalia talk. Um, but I guess one of the things that I've really learnt um, and I'd like to put front and centre for us to be thinking about today is that drugs is an emotive issue. It's emotive for all of us. For better or worse, all of us have our own personal instincts and gut reactions and emotions and thoughts and feelings that influence how we feel and how we react to suggestions about services or doing things differently. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I think it's worthwhile acknowledging it because I don't think we can or should ignore that our own personal values and experiences influence us in terms of how we come at these discussions. The reason we shouldn't ignore it is because um, often what the evidence teaches us is counterintuitive. And I think it's best to acknowledge and be upfront about why we might be responding, albeit internally, um, and that voice that says, well, why would you want to do that? Um, because it does make it harder for all of us, including us in the room that espouse evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine. The reality is that the emotion and the morality and the stigma and the personal experience and the value system we have does influence how we respond and how we react. A, a colleague of mine who used drugs for nearly 20 years and who's now gone on and leads a professional life spoke recently at a conference that I was, was at and she was talking about stigma and she was talking about shame and she said it, it might seem like a sensible idea if we don't want people to use drugs then surely we tell them not to and surely we try and put in place punitive measures so that they don't do it and surely we try and shame them into stopping them using but actually what that does for the users and themselves is make everything worse and as she said um, and summing it up wiser than I ever could why did we think that shame and stigma were ever going to improve somebody who was always already feeling that life was worth was not worthwhile so I would encourage you to engage with the inner voice in your room, in your head, um, and the other voices of people in the room. 
And I would encourage you just a little bit to step outside your comfort zone as we talk about some things that may not fit with your ideal world or your view of what we should or shouldn't do. I'm going to show you a film, which is a short film that goes for about 14 minutes and it basically will take you inside the safe room in Sydney, in King's Cross. Um, all of the people are real in it, except for the people that play the service users. We looked at getting actors, but they were so dreadful because, of course, people are not normally present for the drug injecting that we thought we'll just get our staff to do it because actually they're better and they know what they're doing. Um, but otherwise, everybody else in the, in the film is real. Um, mostly there's titles down the bottom so that you understand who people are, but there's two people that for an Australian or a New South Wales audience, we didn't put titles because they were the head of, of the state. So um, two premiers, um, and what I'll do is just go number one and then number two so that you know that they're the political leaders when they come up on the screen and talk. Um, and then we'll go over that a little bit more. Sydney's first legal drug centre hasn't won over all its critics, but it still looks like it's here to stay. Well, the truth is heroin use happens, and the challenge for society is how to help those addicted survive and eventually get clean. It wasn't going to be a, a magic bullet, but it was going to be better than the alternative. This is the story of Australia's first and only medically supervised injecting centre, the Sydney M Sick. Sammy, you can go through. Hi Maria, how are you today? I'm bad. I lost a girlfriend in Melbourne who overdosed in this alley where everyone used to go. What was your password? That infuriated me. We're so lucky up here. What are you having today? I had a heroin today. I haven't had anything for four days. My son and my only child, Daniel, died this time last year from an accidental heroin overdose. He died alone in my car. He was 28 years old. We really need to remember that drug users are people that might be your son or your daughter. They might be your brother or your sister or your next door neighbour or your friend's child. I'm afraid there's no vacancies at the moment. Can you take a How seat? How long is it going to be? It shouldn't be too long. Daniel was an intelligent young man. He hated what it did to him, but he was gripped with addiction. I speak to people who smoked for a lot of years and usually they've tried a number of times to come off. Doesn't matter what drug you're talking about, it's a chronic relapsing condition. We've had people say to us, well just simply tell him to stop. If only it were that easy. Hi Dave. What's your password? I well, don't have a password. You've never been here before? No. Alright, you need to complete the registration form. It was in the late 1980s with the threat of HIV that the federal government introduced a national drug policy of harm reduction. And primarily harm reduction says, we may not like what's going on and we may not approve of it, but the key issue is to keep people safe, keep people alive, keep people disease free. Because it'll get someone to do the rest of it. Harm minimisation is the thing I learnt most about, that it had three components, supply reduction, demand reduction, and harm reduction. The injecting centre was a harm reduction initiative just like needle and syringe exchanges are. If he didn't have clean needles, I felt that he was probably going to be facing major health issues down the track. Oh, hi Sarah, it's Nicola. Can you please come down and do a registration? We have countries where the rates of HIV amongst people who inject drugs are more than 50%. In Australia, it's about 1%. Why? Because of harm reduction programs like needle syringe services. During the 1990s, drugs, and particularly heroin and cocaine, became more and more prevalent here on the streets of King's Cross. People would come to King's Cross to buy their drugs and then want to use them straight away. So they would be injecting drugs in alleyways, in recessed doorways, behind parked cars, drawing up water out of puddles. It didn't matter where you walked in King's Cross, you could see signs of injecting drug use. King's Cross had the dubious honour in the late 1990s of having the highest overdose death rate in the country. We were seeing heroin overdose deaths escalate such that they actually exceeded the national road toll. Bob Carr was the then Premier of New South Wales. He basically said that if Labor won the election, he would hold a drug summit. He was elected and the drug summit did occur. 
The Drug Summit was an amazing event. There were representatives of health professionals, researchers, family members, people who inject drugs, police, all there together discussing the drug problem. For once, people were speaking about the merits of the case and not playing party politics. 172 recommendations came out of the Drug Summit. The most controversial recommendation was to trial a supervised injecting centre. I myself was somewhat nervous about it, but in the business of this addictive white powder called heroin, better that they use it in these circumstances till they can be encouraged to get off it than have them up a back alley in King's Cross or in a car park somewhere. After the drug summit, it took a further two years of struggle before the injecting centre was finally opened. The St Vincent's nuns put their hand up and uh, I think with the intervention of Cardinal Pell, the Vatican said no, <laughs> and so the Uniting Church stepped in. Uniting Care started it to get it going because the government wasn't prepared to run it through the health system. They wanted a not-for-profit, uh, non-government organisation to do it. People were concerned that it would bring hordes of drug users to King's Cross. In reality, the people were already here using drugs. <laughs> The centre finally opened on the 6th of May 2001. What then followed was nine and a half years of fighting to really keep the service going. The media scrutiny was really intense. The government was really, really sensitive. I think we have shifted a lot of people who had concerns, you know, will it create more crime in the area? Well, that's been proved not to be the case, not by us, but by independent experts. There have been 11 reports by five different organisations, all of which have consistently demonstrated that supervised injecting facilities do work. They don't have negative consequences. There's no evidence at all that these facilities in any way lead to changes in the rates of drug use in the broader community. They just don't do that. Before the MSIC opened, there were people shooting up all through Potts Point and King's Cross, and that type of activity has almost come to a, a halt since injection centres opened. Where there used to be ambulances, where there used to be people injecting in public in a back lane in their backyard, where there used to be discarded needles, that doesn't happen anymore. So, what is an MSIC? So a supervised injecting facility is a premise where people are allowed to come in and inject drugs. They have brought those drugs with them. We don't provide the drugs. We provide a safe, clean place for them to inject. We provide them with the equipment. We also have professional staff on board. So when people walk into 66 Darlinghurst Road, there's a reception desk. If it's their first time, we get them to register with the service. So registration takes about five to ten minutes, is that okay? Oh yeah. We're just going to take some really basic information from you. We take a brief history and then people provide us with a password for the database. So all of this is confidential, is it? This is confidential, yes. Um, how long have you been injecting drugs for? About 20 years. About 20 years. What would your drug of choice be? We do have exclusion criteria. Anyone that's under the age of 18, has not injected drugs before, is with a child or is pregnant, under our licence conditions, is not able to come in and use the service. Thank you. Maria, you can go through. Also, importantly, we have an intoxication exclusion criteria. This is important in terms of the safety of the person themselves and also the staff. Maria is coming through. She hasn't used in four days and she's got some benzodiazepines on board. So just keep an eye on her. What I did with Maria was I rang through to let them know that she hadn't used in four days. She was in a great risk of overdose. Hi Maria, you have a heroin? Mm, yeah. Okay, here's your bits and pieces. Now I know you haven't used for a wee while, so I'm gonna give you a couple of bits, so maybe just have a taste first. So this is stage two, and this is the only place in Australia where it's actually legal to inject drugs. And don't forget to wash your hands. So the main role of the staff in this stage is to supervise the clients while they're injecting and then to monitor them for any kind of signs of overdose. So we're always checking on people. We go over to them, we just give them a little tap on the shoulder and we ask them, are you okay? Most of the time they can respond to that, sometimes they can't, so that's when we step in. What we know is that because we're able to intervene so early, we are able not only to save people's lives, but we can prevent some of the injuries, and they can be catastrophic injuries as a result of drug overdose. You okay, Sammy? Yeah, what? When somebody has a heroin overdose, they stop breathing. If you are waiting for an ambulance or waiting for even somebody to call an ambulance, 
people can suffer brain damage. Hey Jack, Jack. If the person's not breathing okay, themselves, okay. then what the staff do is bag valve mask Jack. resuscitation. Hey can somebody grab me the oxygen? Until the person either comes around or under our protocols, the nurses give 800 micrograms of intramuscular naloxone, or Narcan as it's called, and that will reverse an opiate overdose. The reality is there's about 90 of these facilities all around the world who have seen millions of supervised injecting events. There has never been a death from drug overdose in any of those injecting facilities reported anywhere in the world. You dropped me. The injecting centre has successfully managed just under four and a half thousand overdoses since we opened. 99%. Good work, folks. So I think that's a really powerful statistic alone on the benefits of supervised injecting facilities. Well, that's pretty serious. People then discard of the equipment and they move through to the stage three. This is Willin. Can I see him? Yeah, sure. It's an opportunity for them in a relatively relaxed setting to have contact with health professionals to learn more about treatment options. Hey, well, can you have a chat with Maria? She's not looking too good. Yeah. There's counsellors and nurses in this section who can engage them in discussions around treatment to detoxes or pharmacotherapy or rehabs. We provide information around methadone treatment, buprenorphine treatment, residential rehabilitation, the whole range of treatment services that are available. Sounds like you're a bit fed up, you've reached your limit. I have reached my limit. I've been doing this for way too long. I just had a shot just now, I've been holding off for a whole wing of the shirt. The reality is that most of the people we see have suffered quite devastating childhoods often where abuse and neglect is the norm. People look at homeless people and people begging and whatever and they think look at this piece of shit but they don't realise they're just ordinary people like them but okay, something in their life time. has crushed them. The people we see here they're already a stigmatised, discriminated group of people through their injecting drug use and here they actually get treated like human beings. Oh my Jane, this feels amazing. I've got Maria with me, she's keen to start on a pharmacotherapy program. How soon can we get an appointment? At the moment we see about seven or 800 people every month. At the moment we average during the week about 220, 230 visits a day. We've treated over 4,000 overdoses successfully. We've made more than 9,500 referrals. So yes, we're doing extraordinary work here. Okay, uh, cameras are good. Finally, on 27 October 2012, New South Wales Parliament passed legislation to lift the centre's trial status. Today, after nine years of trial, we are moving to remove that trial status to formalise this service. The number of needles has significantly reduced in King's Cross and the amenity of the area has improved greatly. It's a compassionate solution because it does save young lives and get people into treatment and it's practical because it takes injecting off the street. How could anybody think we could go back to what we had uh, prior to 2001? Judge the King's Cross Medically Supervised Injecting Centre on its results. It was the end of an era. MSIC is now finally able to concentrate on being an integral health service, caring for a marginalised population of people who inject drugs in King's Cross. We made a really good start. We had the appointment organised for you. The medically supervised injecting facility is totally funded from the confiscated proceeds of crime. It means that the money that funds our service is not directly competing with drug and alcohol treatment services. Drug use should be about politics. It should be treated as a medical issue rather than a law and order one. Police reporter Brendan Roberts travelled to Sydney's King's Cross, where locals say the rooms are making a big difference. 100 to 130 needles a day was our average day. Since the injecting centre, if we get a day where we would have two needles, we would think we were having a very bad day. These days, addicts get their fix off the streets and behind frosted glass, and critically, they always walk out alive. Daniel taught me tolerance that I never ever thought I would have, and he taught me My love for him was unconditional. There was nothing I wouldn't have done.
to keep him alive. The cold, harsh reality is that people inject drugs. We might not like that. That might be terribly uncomfortable, but the reality is it happens. I have kept quiet for so long. We have lost everything. It's time to speak out. The evidence is absolutely clear. These facilities save lives. These facilities stop sometimes catastrophic injuries. These facilities take injecting off the streets. They are cost effective and they have no negative outcomes. Tell me, when will the next one open in Australia? It's interesting, we, we made that film a few years ago now and it finishes with, you know, tell me when will the next one open in Australia. I'm thinking we need some healthy competition. We've got, you know, um, our Irish colleague um, and they want to open up a, a safe room in Dublin and, you know, it may be that um, one is going to be opened up in Glasgow and we've still only got one, we're the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we need a little wager as to who gets there first, who's the first across the line can get some kind of a prize. Um, so we've now been operating continuously for 15 and a half years. I think to me the probably three most important things in terms of the court of public opinion for us when we opened, because remember back in 2001 there was only about 40 of these facilities and we were going to be the first in the English speaking world, so it was a big deal. Um, the fact that a church service basically run us. So um, I love the fact that as, a, as an atheist doctor, I reported to a reverend when I started working there as a, as a director. But I think whatever your faith or values, um, it helped people who didn't necessarily understand much or know any of the details um, that it, it was a church service that was running it. So ultimately there was a sense, well, they actually must be interested in saving people's lives. Another crucial factor, I think, was the support that we had from the police. And Andrew was right when he talked about um, some of the issues in the late 1990s and the Royal Commission into Police Corruption. Police were very much part of the problem, some police back then. Um, but ultimately it was the police that were having to phone the next of kin and the police that were attending ambulances and the police that were dealing with um, you know, complaints about intoxicated people and people stepping over bodies in, in the public areas. So they've been some of our strongest supporters. And the way our service works is through an individual act of parliament, of our state parliament, that allows us to legally operate. And a licence is granted to the uniting facility. And the people responsible for overseeing that licence is, is the head of health in our state and the head of police. So at some level in terms of the conditions, I respond both to health but also to, to police in terms of my, you know, my responsibilities in how we run the service. And ultimately the other thing that was important from an Australian context, but perhaps not so much here, is that it was funded by the confiscated proceeds of crime. Um, I think you guys in Scotland win when it comes to providing free access to treatment. The fact that you guys can get um, easily naloxone and you can get it for free. The fact that you can get um, free methadone and buprenorphine. So if you're on a private program in Australia, you've got to pay up to $270 to $300 a month, um, which is you know, an abomination. Um, so for us, the cost was an issue because the criticism was going to be, well, the money should be better spent on treatment or rehabilitation services. They're underfunded and if we open a supervised injecting facility, then you're directly sort of taking away money from a treatment service. And it's nice for me to, to be able to say, I agree, treatment services are underfunded, but I'm not directly competing against those funds. It's a different pot of money. So after 15 and a half years, um, what we can say is that without question there has been a reduction in the amount of public injecting. We know that both because of random surveys of the local residents and local businesses asking them whether they saw public injecting in the last week and in the last month from the clean up data that the local council and one of the local services do cleaning up needles in the street. We know that there's been a more than 50% reduction in the amount of um, stuff being picked up in the local area. Uh, we know without question that the service saved lives. You know, now with 15 and a half years of service and we reached one million injections a couple of weeks before I came here, there's now 
about 6,000 overdoses that have been successfully treated on site without a single death. So without question we're saving lives, but we're also saving brain cells, just intervening early um, and stopping people from becoming hypoxic or low oxygen levels. Um, we reduce the injury toll, not just the death toll. We know that we're a link into treatment services and we have a full-time referral coordinator <coughs> whose job it is to maintain links with the local network of treatment services in the local area so that we're able to fast track people into methadone, buprenorphine, detox and ultimately um, resi rehabs. Uh, we know that we can reduce bloodborne virus transmission not only through the provision of clean injecting equipment but also providing real time um, advice that is personalised and um, personally relevant to the individual because suddenly they're in front of you and you can see what they're doing with the tourniquet and you can see what they're doing with the needle and you can see what they're doing which is potentially unsafe rather than just providing generic health promotion advice about what they should or shouldn't do. Um, we know importantly that the service doesn't have any neg negative impact on crime and we know that the service doesn't have any negative impact on community rates of, of drug use. And that's important. I think there was a lot of concern when we opened that somehow this was going to become the magnet and suddenly King's Cross um, was going to be inundated with drug users. Well, you know, newsflash, King's Cross was already inundated with drug users. But if there was evidence from the independent evaluations that the service um, basically sent a message of actually injecting drug use is okay, we saw a reduction in the number of people going to detoxes or a reduction in the number of people turning up to treatment, an increase in people relapsing, um, you wouldn't find me standing up here supporting it. If there was evidence that these services were dangerous for some individuals and put their um, well-being at risk, not only would I not be standing up supporting it, but the Australian Medical Association, the College of Physicians and the widespread that's with support we have, they wouldn't have backed it. We also know that there's very good support at both a local level. Um, the residents and the businesses in King's Cross have actually always been, the majority have always been supportive of the service. And I guess it was because they had to deal day in, day out, night in, night out with the realities of, of public injecting. And it was important for us not only just to listen to a small number of sometimes vocal critics, but to actually go and do a random telephone survey so behind closed doors, when people weren't going to be publicly ridiculed, actually just asking them randomly, um, what are your views about the, the King's Cross Safe Injecting Room? And the local support went up to 78%, 80% if you're a long-term resident, and the business support went up to, from 58% to nearly 70%. So again, the majority have always been supportive. We actually know around Australia, we do national surveys every three years, um, again a random telephone survey, and we ask people a whole range of questions, not only about their drug use, but attitudes to treatments and to drug policy. And um, it's been done again this year, um, I think probably it starts in September, so the last year that we've got results is from 2013, but we actually know that 55% of Australians when asked randomly without any explanation as, the, as to the benefits of supervised injecting facilities or safe injecting rooms, actively supported it. And the rest of that 45%, actually most of those were in the don't know, don't care basket. So I think sometimes we have to appeal to our political leaders and reassure them that actually you can make a cogent argument as to why this is a sensible idea and we will help you and put people up behind you to help defend the argument because it does actually make sense. Uh, in terms of what it won't do, some of the good things that it won't do, a safe injecting room will not fix everything and a safe injecting room will not get everybody off drugs. So don't set yourself up for failure. If that's what you want, fine, but you show me something that can actually deliver that. And again, what I went back to before and in terms of values, the reality is that I'm not aware of any human society um, in the history of, of, of our being on this planet where we haven't had um, some kind of use of mind-altering substances. Um, whether we like it or not and whether we do it or not, it is actually part of the human experience and human behaviour is complex and difficult and therefore requires complex solutions and much as, as we all might like a simple solution, I've not, um, in my 20 odd years of working with, with, with drug use, I've not come across one that is simple and, and is easy. Um, the last word before I get you to talk to other people in, in your group is going to go to a, a politician in 2010 when myself and the Reverend Harry Herbert invited all of the sitting um, politicians on both sides of politics in New South Wales in my state to come and do a tour of the facility in the lead up to the legislation being debated as to whether or not our trial status was going to be overturned. 
um, and to their credit, a large number of people came through the service and we had one particularly vocal, um, hectoring uh, opponent of the service and he came through and he listened to what we had to say and he turned on me um, and was very um, distressed and aggressive in what he said and he looked me in the eye and he said, you've just told me that people come in here with drugs they've bought on the black market. You've just told me that you don't provide them with clean drugs. You've just told me that you don't do any testing of the drugs and you don't know what's in it. You've just told me you let them inject drugs. Do you have any idea, young lady, how dangerous that is? You call yourself a doctor. And of course the answer to that is yes, of course we have an idea of how dangerous it is and that's why we're here. So what I want you to do before we all take questions is Talk to the people on your table. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes while we get everybody sitting out here to answer questions. I want you to each tell someone at your table a reason why a safe injecting room isn't a good idea and what an argument would be against one opening. And then I want you to tell other people on the room one reason why you think a safe injecting room is a good idea and why you would support it and what you would do to help one open.